Welcome everyone. My name is Francine Allen. I'm a registered dietitian with Medical Affairs at Nestle Healthcare Nutrition. I am delighted to introduce today's speaker and assist with the webinar entitled Nutrition Focused Physical Assessment Part 1, Setting the Stage for Success. This is the first webinar of a three-part series. Nutrition Focused Physical Assessment Part 2, Creating Your Malnutrition Toolbox, and Nutrition Focused Physical Assessment Part 3, Micronutrient Deficiencies, will be available soon. Financial support for this presentation was provided by Nestle Healthcare Nutrition. The views expressed are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent Nestle's views. The material is accurate as of the day it was presented and is for educational purposes only. It is not intended as a substitute for medical advice. Dr. Laura Frank is a registered dietitian and holds a BS in nutritional science, a master's in nutrition and dietetics, and a doctorate in exercise physiology. While working as a postdoctoral fellow for the University of Washington, she also received a master's in public health in epidemiology. Dr. Frank has published several peer-reviewed papers and book chapters. Currently, Dr. Frank is Clinical Assistant Professor and Director Preceptor of Clinical Sites for the Coordinated Program in Dietetics in the Nutrition and Exercise Physiology Program at Washington State University in Spokane. She is also the owner of Frank Nutrition and Exercise Consulting. She works closely with malnourished patients providing nutrition intervention to maintain and promote lean body mass, replete nutritional status, and improve health outcomes. Dr. Frank is active in various nutrition organizations and has spoken at the local, state, and national level regarding changes in the healthcare landscape and elevating the role of the dietitian in nutrition assessment, physical assessment, and evidence-based nutrition intervention to treat the malnourished, hospitalized, or community-dwelling adults. Welcome, Dr. Frank. Thank you. Well, good morning and afternoon for some of you. I'd like to talk to you today about nutrition-focused physical assessment. And before I launch, I would really stress setting the stage for success at your facility. I have some objectives. One, to describe the changes in the healthcare landscape and how these changes affect the role of the dietitian. And to define the current characteristics of adult malnutrition and explain the importance for early recognition and treatment of malnutrition and then to describe how malnutrition can increase the resources needed to care for your patient, discuss coding and reimbursement, as well as the role of the dietitian as part of that multidisciplinary team. Now, healthcare delivery and payment are changing. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or PPACA, is aimed primarily at decreasing the number of uninsured Americans. Changes in the healthcare landscape have been apparent before and after PPACA was signed into law on March 23, 2010 by President Obama. We are changing from a fee-for-service system to a pay-for-performance system. And the main goals and objectives are to increase quality and to decrease cost. Now, there are measures in place to have quality improvement and to improve efficiency in our health care. Dietitians need to understand that there are also changes in reimbursement, that there are changes in the payment systems for preventable hospital readmissions. And PPACA aims to reduce preventable hospital readmissions by reducing Medicare payments to certain hospitals with relatively high preventable readmission rates. Currently, Medicare spends an estimated $12 billion on 30-day preventable rehospitalizations. Furthermore, there will be reductions in payments for what we call hospital-acquired conditions. These include hospital-acquired pressure ulcers, infections, falls, and pneumonia. Medicare statistics show that an adverse event such as a pressure ulcer or a fall injury will occur in one in seven patients who are hospitalized. In October 2008, the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services 
discontinued reimbursement for hospital-acquired pressure ulcers, where nationally the annual cost of treating pressure ulcers is estimated at $11 billion. Furthermore, preventable hospital-acquired infections cost an estimated of $17 to $29 billion. So you can see that there will be changes in the way that we, so to speak, rob Peter to pay Paul. And the time is now to incentivize the practitioner to understand their role in the pay-for-performance system as CMS begins using the Medicare fee schedule to give larger payments for physicians and hospitals who provide high quality of care compared to cost. Dietitians need to be positioned for success and understand how PIPACA will influence medical coverage and payment trends. So what would be the role of the dietitian? We need to help meet these PIPACA mandates by increasing quality by improving patient outcomes, decrease costs by focusing on decreasing our patient's length of stay, the severity of illness and or comorbidities. We need to look at early identification and treatment of malnutrition, treat or prevent hospital-acquired conditions, prevent hospital readmissions, and promote the pay-for-performance incentives through multidisciplinary teamwork. So let's define malnutrition, which may be difficult because currently we don't have a universal di a definition or criteria which defines malnutrition. But one of my favorites would be to say that malnutrition is a state of nutrition in which a deficiency, excess or imbalance of energy, protein, and other nutrients cause measurable adverse effects on body function and clinical outcomes. Malnutrition is also defined as inadequate intake of protein and or energy over prolonged periods of time, resulting in loss of fat and or muscle stores, and reflects types of malnutrition, such as starvation-related, chronic disease or condition-related, and acute disease or injury-related malnutrition. Now let's talk about the scope of the problem. 20 to 50 percent of your patients are malnourished upon admission. The prevalence data for malnutrition is variable due to a lack of universal criteria defining malnutrition. Furthermore, if left untreated, many of those patients will continue to decline nutritionally during the hospital stay. This decline in nutritional status may adversely impact patients' recovery and increase the risk of complications and rates of readmissions. Furthermore, the greater the loss of lean body mass, the greater the severity of illness and the risk of mortality. And you can see by this researcher's slide that with approximately 40 percent loss of lean body mass, your patient would have a risk of 100 percent of mortality. Furthermore, malnutrition impacts the bottom line, such as increased length of stay, increased treatment costs, and increased rates of readmissions. Jenks et al. analyzed Medicare claims data from 2003 to 2004 to describe the patterns of rehospitalization and the relation of rehospitalization to demographic characteristics. With almost one-fifth, or 19.6 percent, of 12 million Medicare beneficiaries who had been discharged from a hospital were readmitted within 30 days. Nutrition-related diagnosis-related groups were among the top 10 causes for these readmissions when we considered the medical and surgical Medicare fee-for-service conditions at index discharge. These included heart failure, pneumonia, COPD, psychosis, GI problems, and then certain surgeries such as major hip or knee surgery, major bowel surgery, and other hip or femur surgery. In addition, readmission rates for patients with end-stage renal disease are twice as high as readmission rates for patients without end-stage renal disease. 
Other vulnerable patients include older adults and those with chronic conditions, such as diabetes and coronary artery disease. Therefore, the dietitian needs to understand these vulnerable patients and to be especially mindful if they're at risk for malnutrition, to have early recognition and treatment of these cohorts. Due to the lack of universal definition for malnutrition, an international consensus guideline committee was formed in 2009 to define malnutrition using an etiology-based approach. Currently, it is no longer appropriate to base malnutrition on labs, such as albumin or prealbumin. And clinicians must interpret albumin and prealbumin in the context of inflammation. The pathophysiology of malnutrition is different depending upon the degree of inflammation. Metabolic alterations associated with inflammation are predominantly cytokine mediated and result in the loss of lean body mass and diminished function. Other metabolic alterations include driving anorexia, elevated energy expenditure, decreases in albumin and other visceral proteins with subsequent fluid shifts to the extracellular compartment and hyperglycemia. Nutrient requirements are altered by the inflammatory milieu. Nutrition supplementation alone only partly reverses or prevents muscle protein loss in active inflammatory states. Therefore, it is important that the dietitian differentiate and understand etiology-based malnutrition. To find whether your patient has starvation-related malnutrition, chronic disease-related malnutrition, or acute disease or injury-related malnutrition, and be mindful about the inflammatory state. The Academy Malnutrition Workgroup and the Aspen Malnutrition Task Force, as well as the Aspen Board of Directors, were part of the consensus committee, and they published in 2012 the six characteristics of adult malnutrition. This slide is to visually depict how adult malnutrition is present if two or more of these characteristics are present. They include insufficient energy intake, unintentional weight loss, a decline in muscle mass, loss of subcutaneous fat, fluid accumulation, and a decrease in functional status. Now note that visceral protein status is not part of the characteristics. However, because of albumin's key role in maintaining oncotic pressure, fluid accumulation is related to low albumin status. Furthermore, providers must assess the six characteristics of malnutrition in the context of these three clinical situations, which include adult illness or injury, chronic illness, and social or environmental circumstances. The dietitian can then determine if malnutrition is mild, moderate, or severe. Now, screening is really a key. Nutrition screening has been defined by Aspen as a process to identify an individual who is malnourished or who is at risk for malnutrition to determine if a detailed nutrition assessment is indicated. Screening for risk of malnutrition is the first step towards good nutritional care. Furthermore, screening for malnutrition should be carried out routinely on admission and throughout the healthcare continuum. Now, there are several validated screening tools, and your facility should be using one or more of these validated screening tools. These include the Malnutrition Screening Tool, or the MST, the Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool, the MUST, the Nutrition Risk Screening Tool, or the NRS 2002 endorsed by ESPN, the Subjective Global Assessment Tool, the Mini Nutrition Assessment, or the Nutrition Risk Index. 
Now, nutrition assessment is suggested for all patients who are identified to be at nutrition risk by a nutrition screen. The RD has special skills, and they are equipped to engage in nutrition assessment. Nutrition assessment is a comprehensive approach to diagnosing the nutrition problem. Information gathered by the RD includes medical information, nutrition information, medication history, physical exam, anthropometrics, and laboratory data. A nutrition assessment provides the basis for an evidence-based, strategically placed nutrition intervention for our patient. Furthermore, we need to engage in the nutrition care process. The International Dietetics and Nutrition Terminology Reference Manual is an excellent guide for dietitians to be able to engage in the ADIME method where we engage in assessment, diagnosis, intervention, monitoring, and evaluation of our patient. Now, today I am briefly introducing physical assessment as a key role for that nutrition assessment care model. And we will talk more about this in the subsequent webinars. Today, I am just setting the stage for you. Some tools that we need to be mindful about would be tools that will help us with our visual inspection and the sense of touch. And dietitians need to step up and feel more comfortable touching their patient and going into the room and engaging in physical assessment. Now, I wanted to do a set the stage for success talk prior to launching into the tools in the toolbox because in my facility, sometimes I have received questions from the multidisciplinary team when going into the patient's room. And I really feel that we need to have goals for the institution and the goals for the practitioner. And they need to be married. So for the institution, we need to create an institutional culture where everybody is empowered for their individual strengths and to leverage for all electronic medical records to standardize language for the nutrition care documentation. Now goals for the practitioner would be to conduct early nutrition screen to identify all patients at risk for malnutrition to increase the ordering for RD consults for at-risk patients, and for the RD to conduct full nutrition assessments, including physical assessment, and to implement appropriate nutrition interventions within 24 hours. What has helped our facility is to find nutrition ambassadors. And there have been several dietitians throughout the nation who have provided excellent talks about how they have sought nutrition ambassadors. Now these ambassadors may include the clinical nutrition manager, nurse managers, wound care nurses, other licensed independent practitioner supporters such as physicians and nurse practitioners, and even targeting other providers such as physician assistants and residents. Furthermore, we need to work closely with our coders and our clinical documentation improvement team. They have been instrumental in querying the licensed independent practitioners regarding malnutrition diagnosis. So in summary, we need to engage the multidisciplinary team, and we need to engage evidence-based research and drive the practice we need to screen and identify patients at risk for malnutrition and perform a comprehensive nutrition care process, including physical assessment. We also need to identify levels of severity of malnutrition for proper coding and intervention strategies. Dietitians also need to have a global understanding of the changes in the healthcare landscape and promote incentives for success. We hope that through greater identification and coding, 
practitioners will be more attuned to timely nutrition interventions and malnutrition prevention. Now, because I'm more in the trenches and I'm not a clinical nutrition manager, I felt it was necessary that I would interview my clinical nutrition manager that I work with. And these are some of her quotes and goals. One, to elevate the role of the RD as the primary expert in identification and treatment of malnutrition. Two, for the RD to be viewed as an indispensable resource due to our contributions of assuring the severity of illness and the risk of mortality are coded accurately to assure appropriate reimbursement through an accurate reflection of the cost of care provided. And third, to assist in decreasing readmissions related to malnutrition, specifically those most vulnerable and tied to changes in CMS reimbursement. These would be those that I discussed earlier on slides 11 and 12, such as those with heart failure, pneumonia, COPD, those with GI problems, or patient status post hip, knee, femur, or bowel surgery. Dietitians need to have a better understanding of Medicare severity diagnosis related groups, or MSDRGs. The inpatient prospective payment system through CMS established MSDRGs in October of 2007. They account for the severity of illness and resource consumption for Medicare beneficiaries. Documentation of the malnutrition diagnosis allows appropriate reimbursement to hospitals for the collective work done by the healthcare team. The more complicated the diagnosis, the more resource intensive the diagnosis, and therefore it will be reimbursed accordingly. Therefore, it is important to document in support of the most appropriate level of the complication comorbidity to recognize the burden of illness and related use of hospital resources. Using this system, patients with the same diagnosis and similar clinical characteristics are assigned to an MSDRG and the hospital receives a fixed payment amount based on the average cost of care for patients in that group. Now this slide is an overview of malnutrition codes. The major complication comorbidity codes, which reflect the highest level of severity and resource consumption, include Quashiarchor, Merasmus, and severe protein calorie malnutrition. Now please note that Quash Your Core and Merasmus are pediatric codes. Secondly, we have complication and comorbidity codes. These are the second highest level of severity for malnutrition and consume the second highest resources. These include other protein calorie malnutrition, unspecified protein calorie malnutrition, cachexia, malnutrition of moderate degree, malnutrition of mild degree, and a BMI of less than or equal to 19 for the adult. Now please note that we had a coup in the malnutrition world where starting in the fiscal year of 2013, malnutrition of the mild and moderate degree changed from a non-CC or a non-complication comorbidity to a complication comorbidity code. And now the only non-complication comorbidity codes that do not significantly affect severity of illness and resource use, which sometimes are used to define our patients with malnutrition, would be adult failure to thrive and underweight. Now I wanted to give you an idea of how the severity of illness will impact reimbursement. And if you had a patient admitted for pneumonia, treated and discharged, and then that patient was readmitted with weakness and diarrhea, 
and diagnosed with Clostridium difficile colitis, hypoalbuminemia, and a BMI of 16, then you would most likely do a full nutrition assessment. Through your nutrition assessment, you find that the patient is of low body weight and had low PO intake prior to admission. So let's see how defining someone with a non-CC compared to a CC compared to a MCC would impact reimbursement for this patient. So in scenario one, where the principal diagnosis is C. diff colitis, and if the secondary diagnosis was failure to thrive, which is a non-CC, then the impact of reimbursement would be that the major complication for principal diagnosis would get a reimbursement of about $5,000. Now, if the second diagnosis on the primary diagnosis changes to a complication comorbidity code, then you can see that the reimbursement is at a higher level. And then with scenario three, if the primary diagnosis actually has severe malnutrition or a major complication comorbidity code as a secondary diagnosis, then the reimbursement would be approximately two-fold more than a diagnosis with a non-CC. Therefore, in summary, reimbursement depends on the severity of illness of malnutrition. Dietitians need to appropriately assess the patient using physical assessment to help define the severity of illness. Now, we need to seek institutional and collaborative support before we start engaging in nutrition assessment and, and physical assessment. We need to engage the multidisciplinary team to elevate the role of nutrition. We need to ultimately recognize, treat, and prevent malnutrition through evidence-based strategies, and we need to provide supporting language in the care plan to help identify the severity of malnutrition. Now, I want to underscore the fact that dietitians cannot medically diagnose but their expertise can help identify the severity of malnutrition. We need to differentiate between the nutrition diagnosis and the medical diagnosis. Through our nutrition assessment, when we write our nutrition diagnosis statements, we typically utilize the IDNT resource manual and engage in problem, etiology, and sign and symptom statements. I encourage you to include the amount time variables for the six characteristics of malnutrition. I will discuss for you and define for you these variables, or thresholds rather, in our next webinar and when we discuss specifically the tools in our toolbox. But today, I want to give you an idea of how we would write our PES statement to reflect some of the specific areas of physical assessment. So if I had a patient who had congestive heart failure, and through my nutrition assessment, I assessed the patient with severe malnutrition, my statement would look like something that I'm about to read to you. One is severe malnutrition related to chronic illness, example, congestive heart failure, as evidenced by less than or equal to 75% of estimated energy intake for more than or equal to one month, greater than 10% unintentional weight loss over six months, severe muscle wasting, and I would actually say the muscles that I detected to be wasting, and in this patient's case, I see wasting in the temporalis muscle, pectoralis, and the deltoids, and severe lower extremity edema. And that would be an example of how you would want to wordsmith your PES statement. So hopefully we will actually guide our physicians and our licensed independent practitioners to better understand the specifics of why we defined that patient of having severe malnutrition. Now, one very powerful tool is to educate, inform, and engage. I encourage all RDT members 
to be on the same page and have standardized language, having in-services for fellow dietitians, having leaders such as clinical nutrition managers get all the dietitians in the same room and to have standardization of language is very powerful. We want to educate through grand round discussions to MDs, PAs, and NPs. We need to go to resident trainings. We need to engage our nurses because the nurses are intimately involved in physical assessment as well. We need to work with other multidisciplinary providers who work with our patients, speech language pathologists, physical therapists, occupational therapists. And as stated, we need to engage our clinical documentation improvement team as well as our coders. Now, quality improvement projects involving malnutrition can help meet goals of your department, facility, and those for healthcare reform. Malnutrition action steps for setting the stage for success using nutrition-focused physical assessment has been provided for you as a Word document separate from this presentation. Our facilities QI project involves tracking the agreement between what the RD nutritionally diagnoses compared to what the physician medically diagnoses. Now, I have already talked to you about the engagement to identify the patients through validated screening tools and conducting a full nutrition assessment, including physical assessment. I also want to talk to you about what we do after that. We collect data using EMR, SharePoint, and other methods. We monitor charting through chart reviews and audits. And if a licensed independent practitioner has not already diagnosed the patient as malnourished, the coder reviews the RD notes for the degree of malnutrition. And then the coder notifies the physician with a request to document the degree of malnutrition based on the dietitian language. And we track the agreement between what the RD assesses nutritionally and what the physician codes. We use the CDI team to assist with querying the providers as well as tracking and following the level of agreement between the providers. We choose outcome data to highlight from the data that we collect. Some of this would be reflected for the severity of illness or reimbursement for our patients, the length of stay, hospital acquired conditions, treatment costs, and readmission rates. Our hope is to disseminate this data to the team and the administration, and then ultimately meet with the medical executive committee and other committees to drive change and make policies. We also collaborate with our IT group and in the process of designing templates for documentation of malnutrition. An example would be to utilize auto-generated assessment protocols where we utilize the malnutrition characteristics and we use drop-downs for the selection of impact of characteristics over a time frame. We use nutrition-focused physical assessment to help define patients with moderate versus severe malnutrition. An example for 2620, or severe protein energy malnutrition, you may have a drop-down that would look like this. You would have the context, and to find that patient of having an acute illness or injury-related malnutrition, chronic disease-related or social environmental circumstance, whether or not they have marked inflammatory response, whether they have compromised intake, and again, I have noted my symbol change for chronic illness, and or if they've had unintentional weight loss over a time period. Furthermore, from our physical assessment data, we would note changes in body composition, including muscle loss, subcutaneous fat loss, or fluid accumulation. You could also have a drop-down that would reflect changes in functional status by either using hand grip, dimomometer information, 
or other such as activities of daily living or out of bed transfers or other measurably noted changes in functional status. Now I would be remiss if I didn't talk quickly about treating our patients and our goal is to have all RDs on the same page regarding evidence-based patient-centered intervention strategies to treat malnutrition and prevent further decline. Historically, CMS regulations necessitated all nutrition interventions be ordered in the medical record by the physician responsible for the care of the patient. But since July of 2014, these CMS regulations include dietitians as authorized providers to write nutrition-related orders for therapeutic diets. These include oral interventions, enteral interventions, and or parenteral interventions. This empowering change for dietitians indicates that CMS is beginning to recognize the invaluable role that the dietitian plays to improve patient outcomes. The dietitian needs to stay updated on new rules impacting medical coverage and payment trends. You have a call to action. You need to engage, explore, and elevate. You are a key player in the early diagnosis and treatment of malnutrition. The goal should be to improve patient outcomes, to engage in physical assessment as part of the nutrition care process. Set the stage for success through institutional and collaborative support. Explore severity of malnutrition and document with appropriate language to drive DRG identification by utilizing physical assessment and elevate the role of nutrition in healthcare to meet PPACA mandates. I want to thank you for your attention today and I'm excited to talk about the tools in the toolbox, which we will discuss on April 8th when we have our second part of this webinar. And then my very favorite is to discuss micronutrient deficiencies starting on April 29th, and I hope to have everybody listen in at that time too. Again, thank you for your time today, and I hope you feel empowered to set the stage for success at your facility. Thank you, Dr. Frank. That was excellent information. Um, you really did a great job of, of helping people understand the basics of malnutrition and setting the stage for success in their facility for nutrition-focused physical assessment. Um, we've gotten several questions already. Uh, let me start with this one. What do you do when the, when the MD disagrees with the dietitian's diagnosis of malnutrition? Well, we have our uh, assistance from our, our CDI team, and what we do is we have individuals uh, contact the physician and query them. And we do not always have agreement. And so what, that is what we're doing right now. We're tracking the degree of agreement. And what we'll do is we will continue to engage in education, and we will continue to have grand round discussions and intimate conversations to be able to have the physician understand the level of skill that the dietitian has to nutritionally diagnose malnutrition. And so we, we continue to fight the fight, so to speak, and through our educational efforts and collaborative efforts, we've had a much better rate of agreement between providers. Okay, great, thank you. We had a couple questions about muscle wasting, and here, here's one of them. Um, in the hospital setting, the RD is saying she might not have access to a patient's appearance prior to admission to enable judgment of time frame for muscle wasting. Is that a concern? Or is it sufficient to simply identify that mu muscle wasting has occurred regardless of the time frame? We had a couple questions along those lines that you haven't seen the patient before. Okay. Well, I think that the answer may be a little bit better for the next webinar, but I'll, I'll address it now. And remember that approximately a third of your patients are coming in malnourished. And we need to be realistic and understand, especially with our vulnerable cohorts, that 
malnutrition happens before the hospital stay and unfortunately continues during the hospital stay. So we really need to be mindful that our patients do come in malnourished. Now, if you cannot see your patient and, and actually engage in physical assessment, then you need to rely on objective measures. If you use EPIC or other electronic me uh, medical records, uh, you might have weight trends. Uh, you might be able to use an edema scale. You would have to not use a physical assessment as part of your assessment tool. So I think that it really is up to what, what you have at hand. You know, you, can, you can't um, make something happen that's not available to you. So I think your question is, is it a problem if you can't see your patient? Was that, was that the question? Or they haven't seen that, you don't know what they look like before they came into the hospital. Yeah. So, I mean, hopefully your patient can talk or you have other surrogates in the room, other supporters, caregivers that can help give you that perspective. And so subjective information is key also through your uh, data gathering. The next question is about, um, how, one, two questions go together. go together. How do you gauge marked inflammatory response? And the next one is, is, is CRP used to help assess inflammation? Those answers actually go together. Yes, you can look at an acute phase protein. So we look at positive versus negative acute phase reactants. And it is true that you can use a C-reactive protein to better gauge the validity of the impact on negative acute phase reactants, such as albumin, prealbumin, retinol binding protein, and transferrin. If you are capable and, and, and your facility allows you to, to have those labs drawn, then that's an excellent way to mark the degree of inflammation. If you don't have those available to you, then you would definitely have to engage in physical assessment to look at perhaps the impact on extravasation of fluid into the third space, look at a fluid accumulation. We use uh, the cardiovascular tab in our EPIC to look at the degree of edema. And you can also go to simple assessment or complex assessment through EPIC to uh, be able to ascertain the degree of fluid accumulation. And then furthermore, look at your patient in terms of the context of why they're there in the first place. Do you suspect starvation-related malnutrition? Do you suspect chronic disease or acute injury or illness-related malnutrition? Define your patient with that etiology-based malnutrition model, and it can help you differentiate between the degrees of inflammation. Thank you. I have another two questions that go together. The first part is, I have physicians who insist protein supplements are needed for low albumin. What approach do you suggest? And the second one is, what, what do you do if the dietitian disagrees with the physician? For example, the MD is basing malnutrition on albumin level. Well, I actually look at those opportunities and thank them for getting me in the room. Because oftentimes, if we get a consult for patients because of hypoalbuminemia, then, hey, it gets me into the room, and then I can do my full nutrition assessment. And so what I will do is I will engage in physical assessment, I will complete my nutrition assessment, and I will write an appropriate problem etiology sign and symptom statement. And through my intervention, I would say, please assess CRP to better understand the validity of the patient's albumin level. And so I don't really fight the fight. I just say, okay, great. You know, now let's look at it in perspective. And that's what I encourage my physicians to do. Do you have any suggestions on how dietitians can get to feel more comfortable with nutrition-focused physical assessment and perhaps gain more training? Well. Whoever asked that question, they're starting with a, a great start, right? I mean, all we can do is have the philosophy of more education, going to the conferences, engaging in any training that you can. 
There are several trainings throughout the nation that you can look at. You know, Cleveland Clinic has an excellent training. Um, other hospitals will provide this for you. Going to Fency and Aspen, they will have trainings for physical assessment. We're starting with the ground level with these webinars. But yeah, just any, any way that you can get your hands on resources, then that's what I would encourage you to do. How do you use SharePoint to collect data? Well, I guess we, I don't even know how to answer that, really, because um, I don't know how the I, IT ins and outs work. But what we do is we have a malnutrition tracking sheet that is available to all dietitians. And you have to understand that my facility has about five hospitals that are included in the system. And that's why we have to use SharePoint, so that everybody has access to a document that can be available at all the facilities. We access that document. We use the MRN number. We code nutritionally what we state that uh, the dietitian feels that the patient has in terms of their malnutrition. And then the clinical documentation improvement team and the coders will track the agreement of what the uh, physician has coded that patient to have. One dietitian is asking that um, they thought they had to use exact wording for the PES statement. Are they allowed to add severe in front of malnutrition in the PES statement? We do. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, again, allowed. Uh, I don't think we have a rule can't or cannot. Um, I've worked very closely with our, our coders and what we can say. Uh, so I feel very confident that what we're doing is we're defining the type of malnutrition based on the publication that was published in 2012, looking at moderate versus severe malnutrition. Now you have to be mindful that the IDNT book was published prior to that date and does not differentiate between the type of malnutrition and simply rather they just have malnutrition. And so what we do is we further define, we use an adjective, whether it be moderate or severe malnutrition, and then we use the specifics in our sign and symptom statement to reflect what we have found out at the bedside. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, that GI problems are associated with increased readmission. Um, what, what exactly did you mean by that? What GI problems are, are you referring to? I am sorry, I don't know what Jenks defined as GI problems. This was just um, actually when you look at the ICD-9 code that reflected GI problems, it was the ICD-9 code that stated GI problem, but it did not define what that was. D dietitians are assume they are not allowed to diagnose. So we're talking about diagnosing malnutrition, but the doctor has to uh, diagnose the medical state, but I think there's some con confusion about the word diagnosing for the dietitian as well. Okay, so we really need to be mindful about the adjective in front of the word diagnose. And as I spelled out clearly on one of my slides, we need to differentiate between the nutrition diagnosis and the medical diagnosis. And so I'm not telling you to go out and medically diagnose your patient. What I'm telling you is to engage in nutrition assessment, include physical assessment to be able to better nutritionally diagnose and wordsmith your PES statement appropriately to reflect the level of malnutrition. Okay, thank you. This is interesting. How does nutrition-focused physical assessment trickle down into long-term care? It really interfaces quite well. Uh, you know, I better understand the financial impact in the hospital setting because that is the setting where I work. But I have spoken to some long-term care facilities, and uh, you know, Medicare also has a lot of reimbursement levels uh, for long-term care. The dietitian who's involved in long-term care patients should definitely understand the impact of proper nutrition assessment 
and engaging in physical assessment and defining your individual with a degree of malnutrition. So it, it really interfaces quite well. Remember that we want to improve on our ability to work with long-term care facilities and focus on that transition of care, focus on the continuum of care so that we prevent hospital readmissions. So we really need to look at how do we get our patients better in the hospital and keep them better once they leave our facility. Okay, thank you. What success has there been that you know of with uh, using um, nutrition-focused physical assessment to increase RD resources in the hospital setting? Because there's just, you know, it takes a lot of time to do the assessments and the dietitians just don't have, they need more, either more resources or more time to get this done. I agree. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have a magic bullet for that. That is something that we need to address because um, you're right, if you sp spent 20, 30 minutes, maybe more, uh, with engaging in physical assessment, uh, you might have to have more FTEs of dietitians. And, and again, I'm not a manager, and so um, I'm, I can't address the financial impact with that. Uh, however, it, you know, even doing visual inspection at the bedside, which I hope that all of you are at least doing, um, that doesn't add any more time. And really, when you have an individual with severe malnutrition, it's not rocket science whether they have, you know, some indications of severe malnutrition. And so it is something that we need to look at globally as a profession. And we need to understand the impact of spending more time and resources uh, at the bedside with our patient. Is it appropriate to use the diagnosis of acute on chronic conditions to help diagnose malnutrition? I don't know how to say you can't, but I, I don't say that because I try to stick to the language from the publication. Now, the six characteristics I believe right now, they're being validated, there are studies ongoing to validate those six characteristics. And so, uh, you know, more to follow on that, and uh, perhaps those definitions will be broadened as to use acute on chronic as that adjective. So currently, I just uh, use those adjectives that were reflected from the publications. Okay. We have one more quick question. Um, is, is obesity considered a DRG? Yes, obesity is. Uh, I did not include it today because uh, most times they don't use obesity for malnutrition, although we all know that obese individuals can definitely be malnourished. Okay, thank you. Well, I think that's all the time we have now for questions. That was really excellent. Thank you for taking the time to answer all those questions so thoroughly. Um, I'd like to thank you again for your presentation and thank each of, the, each of you who participated and sent questions into us. On behalf of the Nestle Nutrition Institute, we hope that you found this information valuable to your practice and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.